Thank you, worship team. It's uh, great to be led by you this weekend. My name is Ryland. I'm one of the worship leaders here, and it's an honor uh, just to preach this weekend and be standing in for such a great pastor. Uh, he kicked off this series that we're calling Active Faith, and it's about how to activate our faith. And in week one, we looked at the tension uh, between faith and works. And what we discovered is that there's really no tension at all, is there? That good works are the natural fruit of a life that is rooted in faith. That's just what happens is that someone becomes a believer, they put their faith in Jesus, and you're going to have fruit, and that fruit is good works. And then last week we looked at um, how to activate our faith in the sense of community and how our faith infiltrates our community and our friendships and our relationships and changes the way we live with others. Now this week I'm going to take this series another step further and ask the question uh, of where do we get this power that the Bible talks about? How do we tap into the power of God and of, of Christianity? There, there are several verses in the Bible about the power of God that is in a believer who puts their faith in Christ. And where do we find that power? And I just want to read through some scriptures that uh, they're not in your outlines, they're just on the screen. And I'll just tell you that these verses used to be a real source of frustration for me. As I, was, as I would read these passages and I would wonder, where is this power? I don't have a, any sense of this power that the Bible's talking about. Scriptures like 2 Peter 1.3. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for a godly life. And I would think, I have everything I need for a godly life. I mean, really? I'd love to be able to say that. I'd love to be able to believe that, to feel that. But I don't really have any kind of sense of this divine power in my life. I don't feel like I have everything I need to live a godly life. Another verse was Ephesians 1, 19 through 20. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realm. So I can come to understand, I can come to understand the power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in heaven at the right hand of God in a place of power and authority, I can understand that. Philippians 2.13, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Sometimes it feels like we don't even have the desire, let alone the power, to do what pleases God. And then finally, 1 Corinthians 4.20, For the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk, it is living by God's power. But that's exactly what it felt like. It began to feel like the kingdom of God was just a lot of talk. That this power in Christianity and this sense of of ultimate fulfillment in Christianity was just a lot of talk and that I would never see it in my life. It felt like the Bible was over-promising and under delivering. It felt like God was over promising something and under delivering. And I began to ask the question is it really possible for a believer to experience and understand this power? Is it really possible for a believer in Jesus Christ, a Christian, to experience and feel this power? Is it really possible? For a believer to overcome sin. I mean, that was the question. That's what I needed the power for. As we live in an ungodly age, an evil age, an ungodly world. And I wanted to know, is it ever going to be possible for a Christian to overcome sin in their life? And it's not difficult to be convinced. You know and I know that if it were possible to overcome sin in this life, it would have to be by some divine power, right? It would have to be a work of God. We've tried managing it on our own. We've tried overpowering sin on our own. And we can't do it. Our sin nature always comes out and wins. And God knew his power would be something we struggle to understand and experience. And he knew we would be asking, where is this power? So there are sections of the Bible written to answer this question specifically. And my favorite is a section in a letter that was written to the Romans by the Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 6, 
where the Apostle Paul uses the word power seven times in 23 verses. In Romans 6, 1, let's look at it together. Well then, okay, I promise I won't stop every two words, but I'm already going to stop. He's responding to what was written just before in Romans chapter 5. And Romans 5 is one of the most difficult passages of Scripture because in Romans 5, we discover the head of the human family. And the head of the human family is Adam. Adam and Eve sinned, and you know the story. Sin, by virtue, entered the world and broke creation. And by virtue, we have this nature. By nature, we are sinners now. It spread to all of humanity, all of creation. So by nature, we are sinners, and we enjoy sin. We enjoy it. Sin is fun. I know you're in church, but you can admit it. It's fun. If it weren't fun, why would we do it? If we didn't enjoy it on some level, why would we be attracted to it? Now, we know sin doesn't end in fun. We know it doesn't end in enjoyment. We know it leads to destruction. But in the moment, it feels good. It feels like the right thing to do. Even if you're an unbeliever, you know this. A lot of things that God sees as sin, even unbelievers agree, are destructive. That's why we're all creating laws to avoid those sins And we go to counseling or maybe even rehab because we recognize there's things we enjoy in the moment, but ultimately they destroy us and they destroy other people. So sin attracts us with fun, but in the end it destroys us. And we've seen this. It destroys relationships. It destroys minds. It destroys bank accounts. It destroys families and more. It is a beast that takes out everything in its path And leaves us with a rubble of shame. And even though our minds know this. And even logic tells us. And experience tells us that sin is bad for us. We still sin. Why? Because something inside of us. Something in our nature. Dating all the way back to Adam. Says that even though it's unfulfilling in the end. That there's some enjoyment to be had in the moment. It's going to be fulfilling in some way. But you know what also we discovered in Romans chapter 5? That there's another head of the human family. And his name is Jesus. And he brings us fulfillment and righteousness. And he removes the guilt of sin from us. And he moves into the lives of those who trust him and makes them right with God. Romans 5 verse 21 sums it up. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, Now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So in Christ, in Jesus, we find fulfillment, we find satisfaction, we find fun without any negative repercussions. I mean, this is great. It's this grace is so radical. It is so deep. It's he's flooding our lives with it. And it's a grace that is greater and deeper than any amount of sin or any past. Because of Jesus, our sins are covered in grace and we get eternal life. It's a free gift from God. Are we saved by works? Well, yeah. Yes, we are. Jesus' work, not ours. Amen? So that no man may boast. So now there's no scale up in heaven. Okay, there's no scale with your name on it. To where, okay, now there's good and bad, and I'm just trying to get more on the good side than on the bad side. There's no scale now. If you put your faith in Christ, the sins you commit, they don't count against you. The bad on the scale doesn't count against you anymore. Now, some might hear that and think that the Bible is suggesting that we can somehow still sin and escape the penalty. You know, if there's any kind of suggestion that we can still sin and escape the destruction that comes, that we can escape the fallout of sin, it piques our interest, right? Well, if God forgives me, and I know he's going to forgive me, why not just go ahead and sin? It's a natural question for us to ask because there's something in us that's attracted to sin. And if we can still have the fun without the consequences from God, why shouldn't we? And that's the question God knew we would be asking So we get to Romans 6.1. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Why? 
Why not? And you'd expect him to write, well, it's, it's illogical because it might be fun in the moment, but it doesn't end in fun and all this we've talked about. But that's not what he says. While that's true, that's not what he says. He says, since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? We have died to sin. That's one of the most important phrases for your daily life. He's saying sin is in the past. Sin has already had a beginning, a middle, and an end. Sin is old news. The penalty's been taken care of, the destruction has been taken care of, and the power of sin has been removed. So I may be, I may be tempted, I may be attracted to sin, but now I have a different choice and the power to make that choice. We've got to understand that on the cross, Jesus solved the problem of sin. Write that in. Jesus solved the problem of sin. We rely on what Jesus did. The fact of the crucifixion and then the resurrection is what we believe in. Now, is this verse saying that Christians can't sin? No, we know that's not true. What he's saying is that the power has been broken. We have the power to say no to it. So we might be still attracted to it in some way, but we have the power to see it in a new spiritual reality. Now, even though all this is true and many of your heads are nodding yes in agreement, a lot of us don't feel like sin is old news in our lives. Like sin has already had a beginning, a middle, and an end and is over with. That may not be what you're feeling. You may feel very much alive to sin today. Yeah, we've made strides, but sin isn't old news, is it? If you want to live a life of active faith, you have to deal with the reality of sin in your daily life. You have to realize what's talked about here in verse 3. We'll continue in the verses. Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father... Now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. Here it's focusing on what happened the moment you put your faith in Jesus. It's the baptism of the Spirit, not water baptism. The Bible refers to both kinds of baptism, and the word baptized in the it's really it's just a Greek word that's transliterated. The, The letters are just brought over into the English language, and it literally means immersed. That's why in our water baptisms, we immerse people, we submerge people, we dunk people, because that's just what the word means. So here it's talking about immersion in a spiritual reality. So our physical baptism is a picture of what happens here. Our physical baptism immerses us with Jesus Christ. Our spiritual baptism identifies us with the Holy Spirit. So the moment I become a believer, something essential to who I am changes. The old person has passed away. The new person has come. Things just aren't the same anymore. Something essential to who you are changes. Now, when I think of what it means to become a new person in Christ, I know this is kind of cliche, it's kind of corny, but look up here. When I think of what it means to become a new person in Christ, I picture a butterfly. When you become a new person in Christ, it's like a caterpillar going into the cocoon. And when the butterfly emerges out of the cocoon, it's a new creation. It can't become a caterpillar again, right? It's a butterfly. From that moment on, spiritually, that's what happens to you when you become a believer. You are immersed in Christ and something essential to who you are has changed and you can never go back. You are a new creation. We experience this in life. We, we really do. We understand this. I mean, remember when you were a teenager and your voice changed? I mean, it's, it, something just kind of registered. Okay, I'm a new person. Something has changed. Something has transformed here. You know, how about a couple when they bring their baby home from the hospital? Something just registers. It just clicks. Man, I'm a, I'm a dad. I'm a mom. I'm, I'm a new person. There's no going back. But some believers, even though they are a new creation, 
They want to crawl around like a caterpillar, right? And go back to the old habits and old ways. Poor old me. I still have all this old sin in my life. And they're trying to crawl back to old friends, old ways, old habits. Their old self. Well, how do we choose to trust with faith that we are a new creation? That we have a new nature? How do we get rid of our sins? Well, we can't just put them off by ignoring them. We can't just pretend that they're not there. We can't just think, you know, pretend that, that what's real isn't real. That's extremely dangerous. You can't deal with temptation by, by just ignoring it. You can't do it by human effort either. There isn't enough self-discipline in your world. There's not enough self-discipline to draw from to overcome all and suppress all the temptation. It's like quicksand. The harder you fight, the deeper you get. Verse 6, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this, because Christ was raised from the dead, and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives to the glory of God. Did you know that God has not left your growth to chance? Your old nature, your old self that would have just automatically said yes to these temptations was crushed. And your new nature was given to you. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to grow into it. Our new nature was given to us. We have the power not to. To sin. God has not left your growth to chance. Verse 11 So you also should consider yourselves dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, here we get to it. Circle this word instead. Talk about the power of of a word. I love this word. In fact, I hope today is the day you find your instead. I hope someday you can look back on this day and know that this is the day that God interrupted your life with an instead. You might have come into church with something missing in your life, but you didn't leave that way. You left with the goodness of God overflowing in your heart, overflowing in your life. You might have come into church powerless, but instead you leave with the power that raised Christ from the dead in you. That's what will happen if you do what he says next. So what does he write next? Now, I'd expect him to write, instead, control the sin. You'd expect him to just go on a rant of how you need to get this under control. You'd expect verse 12 to read, do not let sin control the way you live. Instead, control sin. Get this under control. Thank God that's not what he says because we know that will never work. We've tried managing our life on our own. Instead, give yourselves completely to God for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. So how do you break the power of sin in your life? You give an offering. I'm not talking about a money offering. I'm talking about an offering of yourself. You give yourself completely to God. So what parts of your body need to be offered to God? Well, all of them, right? I mean, your hands, your feet, your mind, your sex organs, your eyes, your mouth. Give yourself completely over to God. Offer them as an instrument to the glory of God. Now, oftentimes what happens is we walk directly into sin. Not stumble, but walk into sin and make the choice to sin. And then when the guilt and the shame comes, we wonder where the power of God was. And we become a powerless victim. But we made our choice. 
No, we're not a powerless victim. We have to continually give ourselves over to God. God had made his move when he came from heaven to earth to die our death. And it's our move. Now, if we get close to him, he will get close to us. You know, before I got married, I got some great advice. And it's probably the most important advice I've ever received. And I want to pass it on to you today. If you lead a family, you want to know what the most important thing you can do for your family is. What's the best thing you can do for your family? Publicly declare your dependence on God. Publicly display your dependence on God. You see, we think that raising our families, raising our kids to be self-reliant is the ultimate goal. But really, it is far better to be God-dependent than self-reliant. If you're a husband or a father, you need to show this to your wife and kids. I mean, like, when you're at church, worship God. Like, really worship God. Like, take notes and depend on God. And show your family you're depending on God. And just look for any opportunity to show your family, that it's all about God. I mean, like, serve the church. Show that you're thankful for how Christ has served you, all that he's done in your life. Maybe lead a small group. We're asking people right now to lead a small group in the fall. And it's not a forever commitment. And you don't have to get a whole bunch of people. A win is if you can just get three or more people around you and go through this curriculum and, and declare your dependence on God together. Show others, show your family that you are dependent on God. Show your family this. I mean, like before your meal, just pray and thank God for providing it. And I'm not talking about turning everything into a show. You don't have to pray till the food gets cold. Take it easy. But you do have to show your family where this stuff is really coming from, where the power, the provision is really coming from. You got to get their eyes out of this world and on to where the help come from, on to Jesus Christ, on to God the Father. Let them know that everything is ultimately coming from Him. The key to all this is to yield yourself to God, to give yourself into God. You know, in my marriage, if I don't want to cheat on my wife, I don't wake up every day and like make a list of all the things I shouldn't do. Okay, okay, no adultery, no flirting, no adultery, no adultery, no adultery. I don't just like create a list of laws. What do I do? I fall in love with my wife. I just focus on my wife. I give myself into my wife. And then all the other stuff I'm not even attracted to. Yield yourself to God. That's what it should look like with God. You know, this is just an interesting observation in life. That, that when we're driving, when we see a red light, what do we do? We stop. And when we see a green light, we go. But for some reason, when we see a yield sign, what do we do? We try to beat the person we're supposed to yield to, the person with the right of way. I mean, you enter any roundabout, there's like a whole force field around this roundabout, and all the driving rules are suddenly different. It's like you're in a war zone, and... <laughs> It's all about beating the other person. Well, does God's will have the right of way in your life? He knows what's best for you. Do you yield to him? How do you make the right choice? You offer yourself as someone brought into new life, someone depending on what you've already been given in Christ. You see yourself in a new way because of what he's done for you. You know, under the law... We were always looking for a new rule. We were always looking for another regulation. We wanted some new trick. But under grace, you're not looking for a new rule. You're not looking for a new trick. You're not looking for a new app. You're looking for a new life. An act of faith means we yield ourselves to God. We give ourselves completely to God and see ourselves as God sees us. Verse 15. I love this. Well then, here we go again. Since God's grace has set us free from the law, Does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you become a slave of whatever you choose to obey? Man, this is the harsh reality of sin. We enter into sin thinking that we're making a free choice. I just want to be free. I just want to do what I want. But pretty soon the choice is made for us, isn't it? 
You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God. Once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Because of the weakness of your human nature, I'm using the illustration of slavery to help you understand all this. Previously, you let yourselves become slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led ever deeper into sin. Now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become holy. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. And what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do, things that end in eternal doom. But now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. This is the duh section of Romans 6. This is not very deep. Which do I choose? Do I want to be a slave to death or to life? Do I want to be a slave to sin or to righteousness? Do I want to be a slave to evil or to God? The point of these verses is that human nature is made to serve a master. Americans hate this truth. And we try to pretend it's not true. Freedom is one of our major values. And yes, we should have uh, national freedom. We should have physical freedom. But this is our spiritual nature. And we're going to give in to something. We're going to serve someone. I can give in to temptation or I can give in to God. And today I have to decide. Now some people, they want a third choice. They don't want to be a slave to sin or to God. They want to do life their own way. But there is no third choice. I think about it this way. If, if I'm holding hands with someone over here and they're pulling as hard as they can and I'm holding hands with someone over here and they're pulling as hard as they can, I'm going to have to let go of one and give in to the other. I can't hold under that tension for very long. No man can serve two masters. There's no third choice. I'm going to give myself completely into the weight of the other. You can't hold that tension. You'll have to give yourself completely into one. Now here in verse 23, the writer sums all this up into one statement. It's the two choices and the two outcomes. It's the, it's the good news and the bad news of the gospel summed up into one statement. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Would you just read that with me? For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Eternal life, real life. Man, I want to really live it up. I decided years ago that this would be one of the theme verses for my life and for my ministry because it's an endangered message. Too many Christians are telling people that sin is just making you a bad person or that sin is making you unlovable to God. But the wages of sin isn't becoming some substandard bad person. The wages of sin is death. And the free gift of God isn't simply to measure up to some moral code. God's grace is far deeper than that. The free gift of God is life. And it comes through Jesus Christ. There's no other way. If you want God's power in your life, you'll have to go through Jesus. You'll have to believe in him and give yourself over to him. If you want what God has for you, you'll have to give yourself in to Jesus. If you want God's will for your life, you'll have to give yourself completely to Jesus. If you want what the Holy Spirit has for you, if you want his power, his direction, his provision in your life, you'll have to seek Jesus. Jesus was the fulfillment of the Godhead in bodily form. You'll have to go through Jesus. There's no other way. You can't go around him. Jesus is the gate. No one will ever find eternal life without going through Jesus. You can't avoid him. You can't avoid this truth. You can't go around it. Jesus is the gate. Now, as we close this, let's look at an encounter Jesus had. We find it in the Gospel of Mark. It's not in your notes. Uh, these verses are on the screen as well. 
Mark 10, 17. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions. Give the money to the poor. And you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad for he had many possessions. And I just want to run after this guy and put him in a headlock and ask him, where are you going? What are you doing? Don't you realize who you were just talking to? Don't you realize that all your possessions, all your stuff is worthless without him anyway? What is this guy doing? He's looking for a third option. He's looking for a third option that doesn't exist. He wants to hit all the right religious stepping stones. He wants to be good enough without actually denying himself and following Jesus. He wants the benefits of believing without really believing. He wants to live up to all the morality of Christ without actually following Christ. He wants to pin some butterfly wings on his caterpillar self and call it good. He's relying on his riches for provision and self-worth. It might be something else for you. You might be relying on something else for satisfaction and fulfillment. Verse 23, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. This amazed them. But Jesus said again, Dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world could be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently, and he's, I mean, he's looking at them intently like all ears right now. Let's get this straight. And said, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. What if we really believed that everything is possible with God? What if we really believed that as we give ourselves over to Jesus, follow him wholeheartedly, love him deeply, and obey his teachings, that there is a promise being fulfilled in our life, a promise that is his power, and it's going to invade the mess we are making with our sin? What if we really believe that as we give ourselves over to God and stop holding back, That his power is coming into our life. I think we would find that God never under delivers on a promise. I think we would find that his word stands and it is true. I think we would find that the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. But it is living by God's power. Would you stand with me today as we pray? And I'm going to ask you not to move around much yet. And even during this next song, don't pack up your stuff or leave the room yet or anything. This song is going to preach. And for many people in this room today, this is going to be their instead moment. This is going to be the moment that they drew the dividing line in their life. And they start following Jesus wholeheartedly. Let's pray together. Well, God, there are people in this room that came into church today with something missing in their faith. Some were ready to give up on Christianity. And others have really never given, into, given it a chance. They've never really given themselves over to you. There's something they've held on to. There's someone they've held on to. And I ask that you would give us all your peace. That it exceeds any understanding in this moment. God, I trust that even though we didn't mention specific sins today, that you can speak into the individual life and apply your word. God, we've tried controlling our sin. We've tried managing 
life in this world. Instead, instead we give ourselves completely to you. Receive new life. If you say it, we'll do it. We're following you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.